Hello, YouTube. I am so happy with the progress I've made on this channel, but way before I was on YouTube, I was on TikTok. And at the end of May, my four-year anniversary will take place. But on April 9th, 2021, I posted a video that gave me my very first wave of success. Fun facts about every United States president. This was a series where I went through every American president and listed fun and obscure facts about them, set the Minecraft hardcore and Pokemon music. If you remember watching these, please let me know. After that series was finished, I went on to have a career dedicated to not just obscure presidential facts, but history as a whole. I loved my time on TikTok, but YouTube was what I really wanted to do, and I thank both my audiences for this opportunity I've been given. This is kind of my way of giving back. The comprehensive United States President Iceberg. This is a 15-tier iceberg with over 250 entries dedicated to fun facts, obscurities, weird elections, lost media, tragedies, conspiracies and controversies, everything in between, all surrounding the presidents of the United States. All of my knowledge on the presidents in one video, or I guess four. This is part one, and we'll cover the first five tiers of the iceberg in it, with part two the next week and part three the following. On April 27th, the finale will be posted, compiling all three parts of any corrections I need to make and any extra entries I think of in the meantime. I've already got a list of 30. We're going to begin with Tier 1 very shortly, and Tier 1 kind of sets up the rest of the iceberg. It introduces well-known topics and rules so we can break them later as we go further down. But without further ado, let's take this massive dive into this iceberg, beginning with Tier 1. I think it's only fitting we begin this massive dive into the presidents with the place they call home, the White House. The first president to live in it was John Adams. It began construction on October 13, 1792, which was during Washington's terms. So the first president did his duties from a house he had purchased in New York and Philadelphia. Since then, the building has gone through some massive changes. It survived two massive fires, underwent a complete renovation while Truman was in office, the East Wing was also added on, and if we back up a bit, in 1902, during Teddy Roosevelt's terms, he had the West Wing built on. The White House has been the birthplace of many conspiracies, strange visits, fun facts, parties, and more, so expected to see it several times throughout the iceberg. The 4th of July is America's Day of Independence, and it's celebrated every year with fireworks and other festivities. In terms of presidents, we've had three presidents die on the 4th. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson on July 4th, 1826, the same day, a story we'll cover much later into the iceberg, and James Monroe would die five years later. We've had one president born on July 4th, Calvin Coolidge, in 1872. The First Lady is the wife to the president, and we've had some notable ones throughout history we'll dive into throughout the iceberg. The term first appeared in print around the 1830s, and before this, they would be referred to as the Presidentress, Miss President, or if you're Martha Washington, Lady Washington. The first person to have the title applied to her while actually in office was Harriet Lane, the niece of James Buchanan. If a president were to have a male partner, they would be referred to as the First Gentleman. This term was created for Doug Ermhoff, Kamala Harris's husband. Once the president is determined unfit to hold the office for whatever reason, the process of impeachment may begin. Impeachment begins in the House of Representatives. If a majority votes in favor, it goes on to the Senate, where an impeachment trial is held and resided over by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. If found guilty there, the president or any elected official is removed from office. There is a misconception that impeachment means removal, but that's not the case. There have been four cases of presidential impeachment, Andrew Johnson in 1868, Bill Clinton in 1998, and Donald Trump twice, once in 2019 and once in 2021, making him the only president to be impeached twice. Richard Nixon had articles of impeachment brought against him post Watergate, but he resigned the office because he knew he was going to be removed. A topic of discussion that has been raised recently is the age of presidents. Joe Biden is currently 81 and was 78 at the time of election, making him the oldest president. Before this, it was Donald Trump, the one right before him, and he was 77. Before this, 
Ronald Reagan, who was the 40th, was the oldest, and he usurped this title from William Henry Harrison, the 9th. Harrison was 68 and was mocked relentlessly for his age, which he used in his campaigning, something we will discuss later. Opposite side, you have to be at least 35 years old to be president, and we've never had a president in their 30s. The youngest ever elected president was John F. Kennedy, being elected at age 43. But the youngest ever president was Theodore Roosevelt at age 42. But he wasn't elected at first. He became president after William McKinley died, and by the time he was elected for a second term, he was 46. The length of one presidential term is four years, and the max a president can serve is two terms, so eight years in total. The longest ever serving president was FDR, who served for four terms, a total of 12 years and one month, as he died early into his fourth. After this, the 22nd Amendment was added, which limited the term length to two. A handful of presidents were elected and served under one full term, and the shortest ever presidency was William Henry Harrison, who died only one month after being elected. We'll discuss the other varying reasons why presidents have served incomplete terms as we go further down the iceberg. There are a few requirements to run for president, and the first and best known one is the age, which we mentioned, it's 35 years old. But the president must also be a citizen whether born in America or born to American citizens. And finally, they must have lived in the United States for 14 years. Opponents of presidents have tried to make them unable to run because of their inability to meet these demands, and once again, these scandals will be brought up throughout the iceberg. It's well known that if a president dies in office, the vice is to take over. But the line goes further down than this. It goes vice, speaker of the house, president of the senate, the secretaries of state, treasury and defense, and further down into an 18-step line. We've only made it to the vice president, and the line of succession was officially adapted in 1947, following the previous death of Franklin Roosevelt and the step of Vice President Harry Truman into the office. Now this had happened before, and the first time it happened was in 1841, when William Henry Harrison died and John Tyler took over. He kinda just did this, there was no cause for him to do so. This has happened several times, whether the president died by assassination, natural causes, or they were made temporary unavailable. In 2007, when George Bush underwent anesthesia for a colonoscopy, his vice, Dick Cheney, became the temporary president. And he wrote a letter in this time, making him the only person to officially use this title. This also recently happened with Biden and Harris. The most commonly used denominations of paper money in America are the $1, 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100. And on these dollars in order are George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Alexander Hamilton, Andrew Jackson, Ulysses Grant, and Benjamin Franklin. Of these six men, four of them are presidents, which leaves us with Hamilton and Franklin. Alexander Hamilton was our very first Secretary of Treasury, and he's responsible for a lot of our financial systems. He was first added to the $10 bill in 1929. Before this, it was a handful of different people, and it started off with then-current President Abraham Lincoln. The $100 bill features Ben Franklin because he was the most important founding father, and he was first added to the bill in 1914. Now let's quickly discuss the 20, which currently features Andrew Jackson. He's not going to be on there for much longer, as he's said to be replaced by Harriet Tubman in 2030, making her the third non-president to feature on a current bill. There's also been a handful of larger denominations than 100 in history, and we will discuss them later down. Before we move on, let's quickly mention the $2 bill, featuring Thomas Jefferson. These aren't as common, but they're easily accessible, as you can just go to any bank and request them. Remember how we mentioned political opponents would try and disqualify their opponents based upon their failure to meet the requirements to run? Here's our first and best well-known case. The controversy of Obama's birthplace. Officially, Obama was born in Honolulu, Hawaii, and this is where the discussion should end. But many people believe his birth certificate and records are forgeries, and that his real birthplace was in Kenya. This matter first arrived in 2008, claiming that Obama's mom was a Kenyan citizen gave birth to Barack there, and flew to Hawaii to register his birth as that state. 
Later around his second term, future President Donald Trump would jump on this movement. But then, in April 2011, Obama's birth certificate was revealed and it said he was born in... Hawaii. This pretty much ended the conversation around the topic, and Obama jokes about it to this day. But just in case there are any lingering questions, tonight I'm prepared to go a step further. I am releasing my official birth video. Let's take a look. I want to make clear to the Fox News table, that was a joke. When Donald Trump was elected in 2016, he made history for a few reasons. And one of them was the new cementation of the richest president, and the only billionaire president. A lot of the older presidents are atop the list of the richest because of their land and their slaves, which we will discuss in detail very soon. Other presidents had businesses before they became president, and most notably is Herbert Hoover, who made his money in the mining industry. All of this and the poorest presidents will be discussed later down, and if you want a great video that dives into the wealth of every president, I recommend Mr. Beat's video. After John F. Kennedy was assassinated, the protection of the president became a topic of discussion, and one major change was the creation of a protected car. Now this was in the 60s, so cars weren't exactly new, and the first president to ride in one was William McKinley, and this was in 1900. So 60 years later, here we are with a dead president in a car. What's our next step? We make it a beast. The original car was stripped and destroyed to prevent collectors from obtaining any piece of it, or to hide how the CIA killed him. But then the car was refitted with bulletproof tires, a powerful engine, and 1600 pounds of bulletproof armor. In later years, the presidential limo continued to be improved upon, and we will now discuss the modern one. It was commissioned in 2014, and General Motors received about $20 million in our modern money to get it done. It is still nicknamed the Beast, and was first used to transport President Trump to New York City in 2018. Let's get into its protective details. First of all, it's completely sealed to prevent any airborne threats with an oxygen supply in the trunk, alongside firefighting gear and vials of the president's blood. The entire thing is covered in 8 inch thick steel armor, strong enough to withstand an RPG. Alongside this, the windows are several layers thick, and the tires are bulletproof, but if they were somehow flattened, they can still carry it for a far distance. For communications, there is a direct line to the White House and Pentagon, and if the president is threatened, he has a panic button that puts him in call with the highest level security offices. Finally, kind of a boring finish, but the doors are as heavy as a Boeing 737's main cabin doors. But if the president doesn't want to travel in a car, they also have the option of flight. Air Force One. This is actually the code for any airplane a president flies on, but it's commonly used for the specialized aircraft created for presidential safe travels. The call sign was first made in 1953, and was made once a plane carrying the president, Dwight Eisenhower, entered the same airspace as another plane, and they both had the same call name, so Air Force One was created. The current plane uses Air Force One as a specialized Boeing 737. It's 4,000 square feet and has a conference room, office areas, rest areas, among other rooms to help continue presidential operations even while airborne. Despite what your history books might have told you, American history is full of brutality, and we could be here all day listening to the crimes committed by our country. And while yes, this iceberg is dedicated to fun facts like I mentioned, but we're also going to discuss the crimes and horrors committed by the executives of our nation. And it's important we discuss how slavery was responsible for the rise to power. In total, 12 presidents owned slaves, and out of the first 12 presidents, only two of them did not own slaves. John Adams and his son John Quincy Adams. Zachary Taylor was the last president to own slaves while in office, and Ulysses Grant was the last ever president to own slaves. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson are the ones who own the most, with them owning a range of 200 to 600 each. This is not going to be the only time slavery is mentioned on the iceberg, it's going to pop up a few more times. 
The Secret Service is a department that is tasked with protecting the president, their families, and any heads of state visiting the nation. They were first created on April 14, 1865 by Abraham Lincoln, one day before he was assassinated. However, the Secret Service was not originally created to protect the president. Their original goal was to investigate and stop the creation of counterfeit money. After the next president was assassinated, or I'm sorry, the third president to be assassinated, William McKinley, the Secret Service was retasked to the protection of the president and they did great. No other presidents were killed. Okay, no others were killed after Kennedy, but then Kennedy's brother Robert was killed. And this is when the Secret Service protection was expanded onto candidates for the presidency, not just presidents. On October 2nd, 2021, NASCAR driver Brandon Brown was being interviewed, and in the background, the crowd began to chant, Fuck Joe Biden. But the reporters misheard the message, and they thought they were cheering on Brown. So they reported the message as, Let's go, Brandon. Thank you so much, Jabs Construction. Thank you, Mid-Atlantic. Thank you to all of our partners. Oh my God, it's just such an unbelievable moment. Brandon, you also told me, as you can hear the chants from the, the crowd, Let's go, Brandon. Brandon, you told me you were going to kind of hang back. The this exploded from here and began to be a stand-up for the actual statement of Fuck Joe Biden. Several politicians have worn Let's Go Brandon merch, and Congressman Bill Posey ended a speech with Let's Go Brandon. They want you to help put America back where you found it and leave it the hell alone. Let's go, Brandon. I yield back. The saying was soon adapted by the Biden campaign, and this is where Dark Brandon comes from. In September of 2022, Biden was giving a speech, and a screen cap that made him look like a villain went viral, and people began to caption it with Dark Brandon. Alongside this, anti-American art made by the Chinese government was posted to Twitter, and people talked about how awesome it was instead, and especially how Biden was made to look like this all-encompassing villain, fueling the Dark Brandon meme. Once again, Biden and his team also got in on it. On August 3rd, 2023, Biden posted this video. I like my coffee dark. He also sells this mug on his website. The first president to be assassinated was Abraham Lincoln, but there were a few attempts before this, and the first, and best well known, was the attempt on Andrew Jackson's life. On January 30th, 1835, a man named Richard Lawrence waited for Andrew Jackson to leave a funeral being held in the US Capitol. In the weeks preceding this, he monitored Jackson's movements and knew he was going to be there. On the day, he was observed laughing while reading a book, before suddenly standing up, exclaiming, I'll be damned if I don't do it, before leaving. Jackson was now rounding the corner, so Lawrence fired, killing Andrew Jackson. Is what he wanted to happen, but his pistol misfired. So in a panic, he reached for a second pistol he had and fired, but it also misfired. And now, Jackson was mad. He began to beat on Robert with his cane, and a crowd gathered, and then the two were restrained. Lawrence went on trial, and he was found not guilty by means of insanity, and was held in several institutions for the rest of his life. When America's government began to take shape, it was decided that the vice president would be the runner-up in the election. This was first decided after Washington left the office, and a real election began, as Washington was basically handed the office before this. This resulted in John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, two people from opposing parties, to lead the nation. It happened again in 1800, but this was the last time as the 12th Amendment was now ratified, which meant presidents could now choose their vices, but could you imagine if this never happened? Could you imagine a Donald Trump with Hillary as a vice president, or a Biden and Trump presidency? Lincoln and Kennedy were two United States presidents who were infamously assassinated, but that's not the only thing they have in common. Lincoln was elected to Congress in 1846, the presidency in 1860, and was killed in 1863. Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946, presidency in 1960, and was killed in 1963. 
and both of them were killed on a Friday. Now it gets really crazy. They were both succeeded by a Southern Johnson who were born a hundred years apart. Both Kennedy and Lincoln are seven letters, and their assassins have 15 letter names. Finally, kind of an underwhelming end, but they were both married in their 30s to women in their 20s. So what do you think about these? Are they just strange coincidences, or are they something else? This is probably our first obscure fact about a president that a lot of people know about, and that is the fact that Abraham Lincoln was a professional wrestler. Lincoln had a record of 300 wins to one loss, and this earned him a spot in the Wrestling Hall of Fame, which he was added to in 1992. But even more obscure is the fact that Lincoln invented the choke slam. The official invention is credited to Paul Herman, but accounts of Lincoln performing this move date back to the 19th century. When Lyndon Johnson had guests at his ranch, he would drive them around as a part of a tour. But one time while he was doing so, the brakes on his car failed, and he, along with his guests, plummeted into a lake. But the passengers did not sink to the bottom, as LBJ was driving the Ampha car. This was a model of car that was made to also float. Only about 3,800 of them were made, and LBJ owned one, pulling this prank a few times. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Nine words that completely define the presidency and would later land the president on trial and would later have him impeached. Ladies and gentlemen, let's discuss Monica Lewinsky. Monica Lewinsky was a White House intern and she began this job in July of 1995. Just four months later, President Bill Clinton would have sex with her for the first time. And these meetings lasted up until March of 1997. Lewinsky stated that his wife, Hillary Clinton, was at the White House during some of these encounters. The stories of the scandal made it to the public in January of 1998, and just a week later, Clinton said this famous line during the State of the Union address. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. We go further into the year, and Clinton continues to deny the allegations. But on August 17th, he admitted to it. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. So, he committed perjury, but not according to him, as he felt since she, Monica, gave him a blowjob, he was not the one performing the act, so this made him innocent. The House didn't buy this, so in December of 1998, just 11 months after he lied, articles of impeachment were filed against Clinton. He was only 17 votes away from being removed from office. Monica herself has remained in the public conscious. She's told her story on several occasions and has been a figure for women to look up to in an attempt to help other victims come forward. The Hoover Dam borders the states of Nevada and Arizona and holds back over 3.2 million cubic feet of water. The dam first entered construction in 1931, during the Great Depression. At the time, Herbert Hoover was president, but the dam would finish construction during FDR's presidency. His cabinet referred to the dam as the Boulder Dam, but anytime it was in the media, it was called the Hoover Dam, and this name stuck. The Hoover Dam is massive, and like we said, it was built in the 30s, but working conditions weren't the best. Consequently, around 100 people died during the construction, and there are theories that their bodies weren't recovered, and they were just cast into the concrete of the dam. The Hoover Dam creates 2,080 megawatts of power, and this serves more than 1.3 million people across Nevada, Arizona, and California. I think it's fair to say that Donald Trump had the most recognition of any candidate for the presidency, as he was a celebrity way before he even thought about politics. He had his own TV show, The Apprentice, and he was just a pretty well-known name. He also cameoed in a handful of films, and his best well-known one is Home Alone 2. However, he was also in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, The Little Rascals, Zoolander, and 34 other cameos across film and television. He's also been in a handful of commercials, like this one for Pizza Hut, do you really think this is the right thing for us to be doing, Ivana? What do your people think? Let them talk. Donna. Ivana. 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 It's wrong, isn't it? But it feels so right. Then it's a deal? Yes, we eat our pizza the wrong way. Crust first. Introducing stuffed crust pizza from Pizza Hut. With a ring of cheese baked into a totally new, thinner crust, you'll want to eat it the wrong way. Crust first. May I have the last slice? Actually, you're only entitled to half. Large.
And this one featuring Grimace. I don't know how you do it. I put together some really impressive deals. But this thing you've pulled off, it's amazing. A big and tasty for just a dollar? How do you do it? What's your secret? Got a buck? You're in luck. Because you can get a delicious, beefy, big and tasty, a McChicken sandwich, and lots of your other favorites on McDonald's dollar menu every day. Together, Grimace, we could own this town. There has only been one president to resign the office, and that is Richard Nixon. Nixon resigned facing the backlash of the Watergate scandal, something coming up very soon in the iceberg. He resigned because he knew he was going to be impeached, so he saved himself some grace and left on his own terms. This ties back to the previous entry. Before Richard Nixon resigned, his vice president, Spiro Agnew, also resigned. This had nothing to do with Watergate. He resigned because of an ongoing trial involving him and accusations of tax evasion, which he was later found guilty of. As per the line of succession, this moved the House Minority Leader to the Vice President position, and this was Gerald Ford. Then, just over a year later, Richard Nixon, the President, resigned, moving Ford to the Presidency. This makes him the only man to hold the office of President without ever being elected into it. Bill Clinton has been a lifelong saxophone player, a fact he used in his election campaigns. One day after the Democratic primary, Clinton went on live TV to play his sax, and it helped him secure the win in 1992, even though many musicians have called out his bad playing skills. Yes, the funny antics of Clinton and a saxophone may have made you forget about this, but rest assured, Tamman will remind you. When the Islander's house was raided, several weird things were found, and this was one of them. A painting of Bill Clinton in a blue dress, channeling his inner Monica Lewinsky. The two were close friends, sparking many conspiracies that Clinton may have participated in the same activities the Islander was arrested for. But this wasn't the only portrait of a president the Islander had, as he also had this. Yes, that is George Bush holding a paper airplane with a toppled Jenga tower. I don't think I need to elaborate why people pointed fingers and raised their eyebrows at this. The topic of the worst president is hotly debated. If anyone says it's Biden or Trump, they're wrong, and they're being blinded by the recency bias. We've had literal slave owners for presidents. But to answer the question of the worst, should we look at it from a character perspective, or perspective of their time and actions in office, or a mix of both? Most people pick office actions, and that's the analysis I'm going to go with for this entry. Some of the most commonly bottom-ranked presidents are John Tyler, James Buchanan, and Andrew Johnson. These men were all pretty bad at their jobs for a myriad of reasons we will discuss later, but let's do a quick spark notes. John Tyler vetoed so many bills it caused his cabinet to resign in protest, and he later joined the Confederacy. James Buchanan did nothing to stop the southern states from seceding. It was all around just kind of an arrogant person. And Andrew Johnston is ranked towards the bottom because of his leniency to Confederate states post-Civil War and his awful mishandling of Reconstruction as a whole. I would say, of these three, Buchanan is the worst. But that's my opinion, and you're entitled to your own. Every year, the President of the United States pardons a turkey on Thanksgiving. I guess we probably should have covered what pardoning was in the first tier, but oh well, we'll do a quick summary here. Basically, when a president pardons someone, they absolve them of their crimes. It's been done before, and we'll cover them throughout the iceberg. But back to the turkey pardon. The first president to believe to pardon a turkey was Abraham Lincoln. Gifts of turkey to presidents were a common thing to give, but the yearly tradition of pardoning a turkey began with Ronald Reagan. After a turkey is pardoned, it's moved to a farm where it spends the rest of its life. As we've mentioned, most presidents serve a term of four years and sometimes two terms making eight years of service. Some presidents were unable to complete a full term due to dying, but even fewer completed a full year of service. Nine presidents have served a partial term, but exceeded over a year. They are John Tyler, Andrew Johnson, Chester A. Arthur, Joe Biden, John F. Kennedy, Millard Fillmore, Gerald Ford, Warren Harding, and Zachary Taylor. Of these men, Kennedy, Harding, and Taylor died before their term ended. Tyler, Arthur, 
Fillmore, and Ford were vice presidents and they took the spot after their president died and failed to be elected for a second. And Biden is currently serving and is expected to serve a full term unless he were to die. Two presidents served under a year. James Garfield was shot four months into his term and died two months later. And William Henry Harrison died a month into his first term from pneumonia, giving him the shortest presidency. After you become president of the United States, you forfeit your right to drive on public roads. This is a part of the Secret Service's protection and extends the president to leave the office. This began with Lyndon Johnson, as he was the last president to drive on a public road. However, a handful of presidents do have sizable properties and they are allowed to drive on them because they're not public roads. John Adams, the second president, he liked to keep a personal diary and he would brag on himself in it. When he was the nation's French diplomat, he was able to secure financial aid to America. He accounts how a Frenchman told him he was the Washington in negotiation and I'll read directly for this next part. This is the last stroke. It is impossible to exceed this. Adams, for some reason, then sent this diary entry to Congress, where it backfired. He was mocked for this, for his vanity. And I'm pretty sure he cried after this too. George Bush doesn't care about black people. That was the voice clip that defined the year 2005. Let's get into why it was said. On September 2nd, 2005, Mike Myers and Kanye West were a part of an NBC benefit event for victims of Hurricane Katrina. Katrina had happened five days before this and did $161 billion in damage and had claimed the lives of 1,800 people. Kanye felt that President Bush had not done enough since Katrina hit and he exclaimed, George Bush doesn't care about black people. Kanye said this because he felt like George Bush wasn't doing enough. Bush, of course, heard about this and said it was one of the lowest points of his presidency. Really, Bush? Really? Really? That's one of the lowest points? You say you told Laura at the time it was the worst moment of your presidency. Yes. I wonder if, if some people are going to read that and they might give you some heat for that. And the reason is this. I don't care. Well, here's the reason. You're not saying that the worst moment in your presidency was watching the misery in Louisiana. You're saying it was when someone insulted you because... On August 1st, 2016, President Donald Trump posted the following. Great afternoon in Ohio and a great evening in Pennsylvania. See you tomorrow, Virginia. And attached a photo of him eating KFC on his plane. This went viral and he was mocked for it. Why, do you ask? Because he was eating KFC with a knife and a fork. This was hardly the first time he got into trouble because of his wild food choices. On Cinco de Mayo of 2016, he posted the following. The best taco bowls are made in Trump Tower Grill. I love Hispanics. Jesus Christ. And then during his presidency, he invited the Clemson University football team to the White House and he catered it with McDonald's. I should have just named this entry Trump Food Incidents as a whole or something. I don't know. Oh, one of my favorite parts of the 2016 election was waking up to see what new goofy antic Jeb Bush had gotten into overnight. Jeb Bush is the brother to George Bush and the son to George H.W. Bush, the 43rd and 41st presidents respectively. He was the governor of Florida between 1999 to 2007 and was one of the front runners for the Republican Party in 2016. The first part of any major brand is the logo and Jeb went all out, making this. Yes, his name with an exclamation mark, which in his words, connotes excitement. Bush would quickly lock heads with Donald Trump, and it equated to just like a high school bully, kind of just giving someone a swirly every day because Trump bodied him. He called him low energy Jeb. Excuse Excuse me, me, am Mr. I allowed to finish? Go ahead, Mr. Trump. So, little of your again, I, 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 I know you're Governor trying to build Bush, up your energy, please, Jeb, but it's not one, working. One, Mocked his brother's presidential performance. He's had the gall to go after the World my Trade mother. Center came He's down had during the gall to go after reign. my Remember mother. That. And just, just watch this clip. That's a tough business oh, to run it, for oh, president. I know. You're a tough guy, Jeb. And, it's, and we need to have a leader that is pr real tough. You're never going to be president of the United States tough, by insulting Jeb, yeah. your way to well, the let's presidency. Let's see, I'm at 42 and you're at 3, so Doesn't so matter. far I'm doing better. Doesn't matter. So far I'm doing better. You know, you started off over here, Jeb. You're moving over further and further. Pretty soon you're going to be off the end. This doesn't do that. a thing. Yeah. That basically summarizes 2016. It was this, day after day, and they killed Bush in the polls. 
Bush then pivoted, beginning to beg for people to clap. Please clap. When America became a country, there were already European land claims on the North American continent, and right next door was the French claim of the Louisiana Territory. France had previously sold the land to Spain, but they retook it once Napoleon rose to power, and in the time of the Spanish rule, they allowed America to travel the land freely. Now with France owning it, this was now void, and America wanted their land back. So, negotiations with France began, and they ended with America securing the French territory. In total, after the initial purchase and interest, we bought the territory for $20,267,622. In return, we acquired 828,000 square miles. That is massive. This was the largest land acquisition in American history, and it doubled the size of the country. We got this land for $32.93 per square mile. In modern money, that is $905.39 per square mile, for an equivalent of $748,636,465. That is under $1 billion. America has a military budget in the hundreds of billions. This was one of the highlights of Thomas Jefferson's presidency and puts him among the list of the best in historians' minds. Of the 45 unique people to hold the presidential office, just under a fifth of them have came from one state, and that is Virginia. Just under half, right at 21, states have given us a president. 14 of those 21 have only given us a president apiece. I was surprised to see that no presidents have come from Florida or Michigan. Is there a president from your state? If not, are you going to be the first? No president has came from my state, and is that going to change? Yeah, probably not. Not for a while, at least. I'm 22. Give me 30 more years and I'll run. The earliest election I can run for is 2036. On the night of April 15, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln was killed in his assassination. And on that night, we could have had three presidents killed. There was a conspiracy to kill Lincoln, and another target in this conspiracy was Andrew Johnson. Secretary of State William Seward was also a target, and he was attacked, but he survived, almost triggering a three-step secession plan. Anyways, back to Johnson. He was at the Kirkwood Hotel in Washington, and his would-be assassin and friend of Wilkes Booth, George Azardot, booked the room. However, George spent the night drinking, and he lost his nerve to kill him. Afterwards, he dropped his knife into a gutter and was spotted and reported, leading to his arrest and later execution. So there's two. Who's the third? Ulysses Grant. Grant was invited to Ford's Theater by Lincoln, but he declined to go. This is because Grant's wife and Lincoln's wife didn't get along, so Grant stayed home. He later called it the biggest regret of his life, as he felt he could have stopped Wilkes Booth. So, what would have happened if Ulysses went? Would he have been killed too? On September 4th, 2009, Twitter user Writing Heard wrote the following tweet. Obama's failure is looking to be so complete that he will hand the Republicans the White House for another eight years. Hashtag thanks Obama. Little did Writing Heard know, he just created a meme. Thanks Obama took off after this, and this saying was attached to any little minor inconvenience. The meme became so viral and well known that Obama himself noticed it and joined in on it. Thanks, Obama. On October 14th, 1912, former President Teddy Roosevelt was giving a speech in Milwaukee when he was suddenly shot in the chest. But Roosevelt didn't go down. As the crowd shouted, kill him, kill him! Roosevelt said, no, don't hurt him. Bring him to me. I want to see him. So the assassin was brought to him and he asked, what did you do it for? Oh, it's no use. Turn him into the police. And he was gone. Roosevelt then addressed his crowd, stating, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Roosevelt then spoke for 50 minutes. Yes, he spoke for 50 minutes after being shot, and he was shot. The assassin's bullet didn't miss. He nailed him right in the chest. But the bullet first went through a 50-page copy of his speech and then a steel glasses case before finally hitting him. 
This slowed the bullet down massively and allowed him to continue. But why did this assassin target Roosevelt? Well, I'll tell you in Tier 6. So I put Millard Fillmore in here just because, like, no one knows about him. In my opinion, he's our most forgotten and unrecognizable president we've had. Let's discuss why. He's going to be mentioned again, but never for anything notable, just kind of odd reasons. But let's introduce him. So to begin, he was our 13th president, but he wasn't elected. He took the office right after Zachary Taylor, another forgotten president, died. While in office, he didn't do much of note. He modernized the White House kitchen, fought a fire at the Library of Congress, and helped save Hawaii from French annexation. Fillmore also had a weird relationship with slavery. He admitted California is a free state and banned slavery in the District of Columbia. However, including in this plan, which was called the Compromise of 1850, was the Fugitive Slave Act, which allowed slaves to escape their owners, they could be returned back to their slaveholders if they were captured anywhere in the United States, even in the free states. Fillmore himself hated slavery, but he signed this compromise in an attempt to keep the nation together and to bolster the power of the Whig Party, which he belonged to. Expect Fillmore to pop back up, probably more towards the bottom because of just how forgotten he is, and even more how forgotten his actions are. I'm gonna be honest, I was surprised when Biden won the election in 2020, but then I reviewed his campaign strategy and went, oh, of course he won! The thing that definitely put him over the edge was his Animal Crossing Island. Animal Crossing New Horizons gives players the ability to create their own island for other players to visit, and the Biden-Harris campaign took advantage of this, creating an experience for their voters. On the island, fans could see signs encouraging them to vote, and they could even interact with Biden himself. Oh look, there he is. And who could forget the ice cream, yay. As the Great Depression swept across the nation, more and more people lost their houses. Because of this, massive communities began to assemble housing out of whatever scrap they could get a hold of. Due to a perceived lack of action on President Herbert Hoover's part, these things were named Hoover Bills in his honor, or dishonor. Two presidents have initials when we say their full name, Harry S. Truman and Ulysses S. Grant. There's probably more I can't think of right now, but these are the two big ones. So naturally, people are going to wonder, what do those initials mean? Well, in both cases, they mean nothing. Truman's story is simpler, so let's cover him first. When Truman was born, his parents could not decide what his middle name should be. They wanted it to be honored one of his grandfathers, who were Anderson Ship Truman and Solomon Young. So to compromise, the S stands for both Ship and Solomon. Grant, on the other hand, was born Hiram Ulysses Grant. But when he was applying to West Point, a mistake listed his name as Ulysses Simpson Grant. And the Simpson came from his mom's maiden name. So, he ended up going by Ulysses S. Grant the rest of his life, even though well, that wasn't his name. There was also a rumor that Hiram Ulysses Grant abbreviates the H-U-G, Hog, and Grant didn't like this, so he changed his name. As I think we've mentioned, President Roosevelt was a popular president. Popular enough to have the biggest election sweep of all time. During the 1936 election, Roosevelt's second time running, he secured 46 out of 48 states and carried 60.8% of the popular vote. His opponent, Republican Alf Landon, only won two states, Vermont and Maine. We discussed the richest president earlier, so now it's only fitting we discuss the other end, with the poorest, and the poorest president was Harry Truman. Truman had a modest background, odd jobs and failed business ventures, and this caused Congress to double the salary of the president. This still didn't help, and Congress soon created the presidential pension. Once again, if you want a full dive into the wealth of every president, I recommend Mr. Beat's video. On December 14, 2008, President George Bush was a part of a joint press conference with Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki in Baghdad, Iraq. Suddenly, a man stood up from the audience and threw a shoe at Bush. Bush ducked and another was thrown, but it also missed the president. The man was tackled and was arrested. After spending nine months in prison, he was released. This man was Iraqi journalist Muntadar al-Zaidi. Al-Zaidi rightfully hates George Bush. 
And as he threw his shoe, he yelled at him saying, this is goodbye from the people of Iraq, dog." Montadir has no regrets, and he posts about the shoeing occasionally on his Twitter. And he makes a post on the yearly anniversary as well. On May 30th, 1806, future President Andrew Jackson faced down Charles Dickinson. Dickinson had insulted Jackson's wife, so the former challenged the man to a duel. The two fired and Dickinson hit Jackson, but Jackson's pistol misfired. He quickly recocked his pistol and shot and killed Dickinson. This bullet would stay in Jackson the rest of his life, but he should consider himself lucky he lived as that was by far not the only duel he was in. The exact number isn't known, but people speculate he was a part of as many as 100 duels and most of them were done in defense of his wife. This is President William Taft, and if you've heard that name, you know it because he's the fat guy who got stuck in the bathtub. But hold on a second, brace yourself because I'm going to shatter your worldview. That story is a lie. President William Taft was a big man, but he never got stuck in a bathtub. This story didn't arise until 20 years after he left the office, and it is a straight up lie. However, when Taft won the presidency, a special tub was installed, and it was big enough to hold four regular sized men. The closest thing to him getting stuck in the tub was one time when in 1915, he was getting out of a bathtub, and it was too full of waters. So when he stood up, water was displaced onto the floor, and it trickled down onto the heads of the people the next floor below. On February 11, 2006, Vice President Dick Cheney was hunting with his friend Harry Winnington. This is the story told through Cheney. The two shot at a crowd of birds, and Harry went to get one they hit. Then, more flew high, and Cheney shot at him, and accidentally shot Winnington. He was rushed to the hospital, and he survived, but he had 30 pellets left in him after all operations were said and done. Now here's the real kicker. He apologized. Now when I say he, do you think I meant the guy who got shot or the shooter? Of course I meant the guy who got shot. My family and I are deeply sorry for all that Vice President Cheney and his family have had to go through this past week. We send our love and respect. He apologized to Shaney. Dude, you got shot. You could have died. Why are you apologizing? Yeah, some of you knew this was coming. Maybe I could use better words, but Lyndon Johnson had a nickname for his penis. He called it Jumbo, and he liked to show Jumbo off. One time, when he was peeing at the Capitol building, he had a colleague come into the bathroom, so he turned around, waving Jumbo, exclaiming, Have you seen anything this big? What a way to end Tier 3. In 1951, Fidel Castro took power in Cuba, and this raised red flags in Washington because he was a communist. We attempted to take Fidel out so many times that he holds the world record for the most assassination attempts. However, we're not going to dive into that today. Today, we're going to discuss the Bay of Pigs invasion. The failure from the Kennedy administration to invade Cuba to overthrow Castro, and it was a mess. On April 15, 1961, eight bombers left Nicaragua for Cuba, but due to the time difference between the two nations, the planes arrived late. This caused the ground forces to go in without air support. Even before this, the attack was leaked to our press, and Kennedy was quoted as saying, Castro doesn't need spies over here, he can just read our papers. That's basically it. It was the lowest point of Kennedy's presidency. Well, second lowest. We're back to the line of succession now. When a large gathering of the line is together, such as the State of the Union Address, someone in the President's Cabinet has made a designated survivor, in case of a mass casualty event that would leave the Presidency vacant. The survivor is kept in a secure and undisclosed location. This practice began during the Cold War, when fears of a nuclear attack were at their peak. The most recent designated survivor was Miguel Cardona, the Secretary of Education. He was made the designated survivor during the 2024 State of the Union address delivered by President Biden. We've thankfully never had to use a designated survivor, but on September 21st, 2016, a TV show exploring the concept came out. 
in which a character named Thomas Kirkman ascends from the Secretary of Housing to the President after an explosion takes out the cabinet during the State of the Union. This is what, now the third time we've said this? Most presidents serve a term of four years and may run for a second to make eight years in total. But this rule is relatively new to American history. It was implemented with the 22nd Amendment in 1947. And before this, we've had several presidents attempt to run for a third term. Teddy is the best well-known case, but others such as Ulysses Grant and Grover Cleveland also tried. But Franklin Roosevelt tried and succeeded. He ran for three full terms and a partial fourth. In total, he was president for 4,422 days, or 12 years, 2 months, and 23 days. Teddy Roosevelt is one of the most highly regarded presidents, and this is partially why. Roosevelt hated the wealthy class, and he hated the monopolies that dominated the market. So, he got to work. Before his time, the Sherman Antitrust Law was signed, which limited monopolies. So Roosevelt didn't even need to sign new legislation, he just used this, going after men such as J.P. Morgan, who was the dominant force behind all of America's railroad shipping. In a very close Supreme Court case, Roosevelt was able to break up Morgan's monopoly he had. Let's talk about false flags. A false flag is an act committed with the intention of blaming someone else, usually to justify an invasion or any other war activities. Think of the claim that Iraq had WMDs. There has been a few throughout history, and one that's debated if it was a false flag is the USS Maine. The Maine was a United States Navy ship that was stationed in Cuba because of an insurrection the nation was having, so the ship was sent there to protect American interests. Three weeks after docking in Havana, on February 15, 1898, the ship exploded, and it sunk. 260 of the 350 American crew were killed. The exact cause of the explosion is still not known, but that didn't matter to Congress and President McKinley. To them, the ship was sunk by Spain, so they declared war on Spain two months later. But further investigations took place in 1976, when a team of naval investigators claimed that it was more likely a fire that set off ammunition in the ship, sinking it that way. Regardless, we blamed the Maine on Spain, and we went to war over it. During the Spanish-American War, a few volunteer units were gathered to go fight, and the best well-known one was the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, more simply nicknamed the Rough Riders. The Rough Riders were led by Colonel Leonard Wood and Theodore Roosevelt, who was the Vice President at the time. The group was made of volunteers, like we said, and included in the ranks for Ivy League scholars, singers, Texas Rangers, and Native Americans. Anyone who could ride a horse could join. The Rough Riders didn't see a lot of action, but they were made popular thanks to Theodore Roosevelt accounting their time in a book, and later silent film adaptations of their actions. What nerd goes to Walt Disney World to watch a show about the president? Me. At Liberty Square in Walt Disney World stands 45 animatronics of the President who put on a show about the history of the President and how the role has changed. The show begins with the Lincoln animatronic reading the Gettysburg Address, and it ends with the incumbent President giving their oath of office. People probably know the Hall of Presidents best because of the Donald Trump animatronic. When it was speculated to originally have been a Hillary Clinton animatronic, three words I never thought I'd say together, and had to be hastily changed when Trump won, and I believe it, look at these. If you're like me, when you hear the word animatronic, of course you're going to think of Five Nights at Freddy's. Could you imagine an ultimate custom night of the president? Someone make it and I'll stream it. I can't believe it took us four tiers to mention Richard Nixon, and he's going to pop up several times, always for the most wild, unhinged, and downright bananas reasons. But I think it's only fitting we begin our discussion with Richard Nixon with a thing he's best well known for, the thing that defined his presidency, the Watergate scandal. On June 17, 1972, five men broke into the Democratic National Committee's office at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. Files were stolen and wiretaps were installed. Eventually, the burglars were caught, and after a massive investigation into them, it was found that they were connected to the Richard Nixon campaign. And even further diving into Nixon revealed that he had basically recorded every conversation he had in the White House. 
And in these recordings, the smoking gun tape was found. You called him. That was Nixon ordering his connection to be covered up. This caused discussions of impeachment and removal to begin, but Nixon beat them to the punch. He resigned on August 8, 1972, almost two years after the Watergate Hotel was broken into. On April 12, 1945, President Franklin Roosevelt was getting a watercolor portrait done, and he began to complain about a terrible headache. This was brushed off, but the president suddenly slumped forward, dead. What did he die of? A massive cerebral hemorrhage. The painter, Elizabeth Shorentoff, wasn't done, and the painting remains unfinished to this day. There's a common myth that Washington's teeth were made of wood, but it's not the truth. Washington had horrible dental hygiene his entire life, experiencing toothaches, decay, and loss. Washington's first set of dentures were made before the Revolutionary War, and they are fabricated using ivory and his remaining teeth. By the time he became president, he had a single real tooth remaining. After this, more sets were made, and actual human teeth were put in the denture set. And these teeth were bought from one of his slaves. There's financial records listing the purchase of a 19th from an enslaved person. This, along with the ivory of a hippo, gold springs, and screws made a set of teeth. Because of his dental issues, he was very quiet and he hardly spoke, making him very difficult to hear. In communication channels, the Secret Service used nicknames for the president, vice, family members, and other prominent people. The people in question choose their nicknames from a list, and the first person to receive one of these codenames was Edith Wilson, the wife of Woodrow Wilson, and her codename was Grandma. The first president to have one was Truman, and this was General and Super Vice. Let's list some more notable ones. JFK's was Lancer, Jimmy Carter's was Deacon, Reagan was Rawhide, Obama's was Renegade, and Donald Trump is Mogul. The current president, Biden, is referred to as Celtic. In his eight years of presidency, George Bush became known for a lot of things. Being a gifted public speaker was not one of them. In those years, Bush misspoke several times and was mocked relentlessly for it. Let's discuss a couple, beginning with the most popular. There's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on, shame on you. Fool me, we can't get fooled again. I also love the time he assured us Atlantis wasn't going to be a problem. Oh, the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. And of course, he wanted to highlight what was important. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. But before we end, we need to discuss the most recent Bushism, the ultimate Freudian slip. The decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh <laughs> Another myth about Washington is the story surrounding him and his father's cherry tree. In the original story, six-year-old Washington is gifted a hatchet, and he accidentally damages his father's cherry tree with it. When George's dad discovered what he had done, he became angry. He asked his son if it was him who damaged the tree, and young George said, I cannot tell a lie, I did cut it with my hatchet. Washington's dad then hugged him and said his son's honesty was worth more than a thousand trees. Yeah, that's complete bullshit, it never happened. So where did this myth come from? Well, when Washington died in 1799 and we rolled over to a new century, people of America were clamoring to study the life of their former leader. So an author named Mason Locke Weems took advantage of this market and released a book about the president. Weems' biography, The Life of Washington, was released in 1800. But the cherry tree story didn't appear until 1806. Mason wanted to paint Washington as this perfect, honest role model, so this story was included. From here, the story has been accepted as facts, and was taught in schools. 
A teacher named William McGuffrey included the story in his textbooks and he sold over 120 million copies, spreading the myth into the public conscious. Every morning, the sixth president of the United States would wake up, strip down naked, and go for a swim. He'd walk two miles, swim in the Potomac River, and then walk right back home. There was a story about a reporter named Anne Royal who followed Adams and hid his clothes while he was swimming and would only give them back if he agreed to an interview. I didn't know this, but it's a fake story. It was completely made up. That was news to me. On April 20th, 1979, President Jimmy Carter was on vacation at his house in Georgia and was using his day to fish. Suddenly, he noticed something in the water, a rabbit. It was swimming after him, hissing and flaring its teeth. So he splashed his paddle at the bunny, scaring it away. The event was picked up in the media and political cartoons were drawn and a segment on SNL was dedicated to the incident. On February 14, 1880, Theodore Roosevelt unfortunately lost his mother to typhoid fever. In the same house, just a floor below this, his wife passed away from kidney failure. Roosevelt then turned to his journal, summarizing the day with one quote, The light of my life has gone out. Teddy Roosevelt is known as the president who started the National Park, so he's revered as this hippie who loved conserving nature. But he wasn't Mr. Innocent. He was a big game hunter. And it wasn't just deer or turkey. Roosevelt went on several big game hunting trips across Africa, hunting elephants, hippos, and white rhinos. However, they give him just a, just a little bit of credit. He was against hunting for the sake of killing. It was all about the sport and being in nature for him. When George H.W. Bush announced his pick for vice president, Dan Quayle, he kind of surprised everyone because he was kind of regarded as an idiot. During the vice president debate in 1988, Michael Dukakis's vice, Lloyd Benson, was debating Quayle. And he began to brag on himself, and Lloyd didn't like it. Let's just finish with this clip. I have as much experience in the Congress as Jack Kennedy did when he sought the presidency. Senator? I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. During Andrew Jackson's presidency, he was gifted a massive 1,200-pound wheel of cheese. For a while, he had no idea what to do with it. But... On February 22, 1837, he hatched a plan. He hosted a party and would invite citizens to eat the cheese and to discuss the country's issues. By the time the cheese was gone, it wasn't, because the White House stunk of cheese for months later. John Tyler was the 10th President of the United States and was born in 1790 and passed away in 1862. And get ready, because I'm about to blow your mind, because John Tyler, who died over 150 years ago, has a living grandson. Think about your grandpa if he's still living. Think about him if he was born in 1862. John Tyler had a lot of kids, 15 in total, and he had them throughout his entire life, way well into his 60s. His last son was born in 1853, Lyson Gardiner Tyler Sr. He followed a similar lifestyle, having children his entire life, and he had two sons of note, Lyon Tyler Jr. and Harrison Tyler, born in 1924 and 28 respectively. Unfortunately, Lyon passed away in 2020, leaving Harrison Tyler as the sole grandson of John Tyler at age 93. So a quick recap, John Tyler is born in 1790, has a kid in 1853 at age 63, and this kid has a kid in 1928 who is still alive at age 93. In the 1980s, America was funding fights against many communist groups across the globe, and the Sandinistas in Nicaragua were one such group. There was a group fighting them, the Contras, and America wanted to back them up. However, Congress passed the Boland Agreement, which limited support to the Contras because they were actively trying to take over a fairly elected leader. But, 
The Reagan administration wanted to continue to fund the Contras, so a workaround was in order. Meanwhile, over in Iran, the Middle East nation had American hostages, and they were willing to exchange them for weapons. Reagan then had an idea. Sell the weapons to Iran, get the hostages released, and use the money from the sale to fund the Contras but all behind the back of Congress. 1,500 American missiles were sold to Iran for $30 million, and this money was then sent to the Contras, where it was immediately discovered. Reagan initially denied negotiating with terrorists, but retracted the denial a few weeks later. So, Reagan was in trouble. Until the American hero Oliver North stepped forward and took full blame. So Reagan never faced any charges, and Oliver North got a slap on the wrist. When Thomas Jefferson was writing the Declaration of Independence, he grew frustrated at his lack of movement his chair had. He quickly began to modify it, and it now allowed the chair to revolve. He took this invention back home to Monticello and modified it more, and now he had the first ever swivel chair. You all probably knew that from epic rap battles of history, but yes, it's true, Thomas Jefferson invented the swivel chair. Did you know the Monroe Doctrine wasn't called the Monroe Doctrine until 30 years after it was given? This is what most people know James Monroe for, and it was a speech given during his 7th State of the Union address in 1823. The main point of the Monroe Doctrine was to end European colonization on the American continent. Monroe made clear that Europe was to not mess with America, and if they were to, it would be viewed as an act of war. In return, Monroe stated that America would not colonize the European continent. Since America's navy was pretty lackluster at the time, Europe basically laughed in our face. Well, most of Europe. Britain supported the doctrine, and Simon Bolivar thanked the United States for issuing it. This photo goes viral once in a while, and is usually attributed to the cursed image drama, and yeah, it's kind of weird, but we're going to explain it. This thing was built in the 1976 election for Jimmy Carter because of his previous history as a peanut farmer. Carter says he doesn't like the smile on the thing, but it was put there to model his own smile, one he would flash during his campaign. The presidents have a long history of having pets in the White House, and the stranger ones will be discussed later, but the best well-known one, and probably most normal one, is Socks the Cat. Socks was Bill Clinton's cat, and was adopted by his family in 1991. He lived with Clinton while he was governor of Arkansas, and later moved into the White House for both of his terms. He kind of became a mascot for the Clinton administration. On the White House's website, a cartoon Socks would help guide visitors around, and he was the star of his very own game on the NES. Hillary Clinton also wrote a children's book featuring Socks, and he would be featured in many political cartoons of the time. Socks survived into Obama's first term, passing away in 2009 at age 20. Before he was president, Ronald Reagan was a governor, but before this, he was an actor. He acted in a handful of films, beginning in 1937. However, in 1951, Reagan would star in a movie that almost killed him, Bedtime for Bonzo. During production of the movie, Bonzo grabbed a hold of Reagan's necktie and began to strangle him. The crew finally pulled the monkey off, and Reagan's tie had to be cut free from his neck. He survived and went on to become president. Yay! If there was ever someone who had one job, it was you, Bonzo. When the 11th president, James Polk, was campaigning, he laid out some promises. He wanted to gain Oregon, California, and New Mexico, and to settle the Texas border dispute, and would not run for a second term. Polk stretched the U.S. land to California, obtained New Mexico and Oregon, settled the Texas border dispute, and true to his word in the end, did not run for a second term. When you're campaigning, do you want to lay out your policies and goals? Of course not! You want to be remembered! Dwight Eisenhower was the first man to get this, releasing the following political ad. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president, you like I, I like I, everybody likes I for president, we don't want John or, or Harry, let's do that big job right. The ad was actually animated by the Walt Disney Company and doesn't set out any goals. It just tells you that you like Ike, and it makes fun of his opponents, and did it work? 
Well, here's the electoral map. Was that all due to Eisenhower's commercial? Not likely. This was the man who led the Allied powers through World War II. He was already insanely popular. Back to James Polk, the guy who made promises, accomplished them, and did not run for a second term. Unfortunately, Polk died 33 days after leaving the office, giving him the shortest retirement of any president. When he died, his last words were, I love you, Sarah. For all eternity, I love you. Sarah, his wife, lived for another 42 years and never remarried. On the other end, Jimmy Carter is the president with the longest retirement, living 43 years after leaving the office, and he's still chugging along. He's 99, making him the longest living president. Okay, one more note about James Polk. He had office hours, and during this, anybody could come in and talk to him, letting him know what he was doing right and what he was doing wrong. Could you imagine this nowadays, just anyone being able to schedule a meeting with the president? The Resolute Desk is where every president does their job at, and it's old. First being given to the 19th president, Rutherford Hayes, in 1880. But the desk is even older than this, as it was on a British ship called the HMS Resolute that was lost in the 1850s but was later found. The Queen at the time, Victoria, sent one of these desks to Hayes as a gift, and history was made. The desk remained in the White House, but was moved during the White House's reconstruction under Harry Truman. When the Kennedys got into office, Jacqueline found it stashed away in a broadcast room and had it moved to the Oval Office where John Kennedy began to work from, and where the most famous photo of the desk was taken. That is Kennedy's son hiding in the desk while his dad works. Once Kennedy passed away, the desk was removed and it traveled with him along with other artifacts. Later, Jimmy Carter purchased the desk and brought it back to the White House, where it has remained since. In 2016, the televised debates of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton is what really made people interested in the election. People would tune in to see the, excuse of the 2016 of me, but how Donald Trump would roast Hillary Clinton. This got people interested in televised debates, but this was something that was already happening for years. And the story of the very first televised debate is an interesting story. The first televised debate by presidential candidates took place on September 26, 1960 and was between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Television was still decently new at this time, so a large percentage of people listened to the debate through the radio instead. Now, the people who watched the debate on the TV said they felt like Kennedy had won, but the people who listened to it on the radio said they felt Nixon won. This is because Nixon kind of looked like a mess on the TV. He hadn't shaved and he wasn't wearing makeup, so he began to sweat profusely while Kennedy looked calm and collected. But of course, people listening on the radio couldn't see what the candidates looked like, and they had felt Nixon had won. At the turn of the century, George Bush was running against Al Gore for president, and it was a fierce race, and it was close. Probably the closest ever election in American history. The election came down to one state, Florida, and this state was won by 537 votes in favor of George Bush. Of course, this decision had a long road and was surrounded in controversy. Originally, the state was called for Al Gore and this decision was based on exit polls. However, between the hours of 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard, the state began to favor Bush more and more. So Florida was moved back to undecided. By 2.30 that night, with 85% of the vote counted and Bush beating Gore by 100,000 votes, it was called for Bush and it was decided he was to be the president. Gore conceded the Bush. However, the three Florida counties left to be counted, Burward, Miami-Dade, and Palm Beach were all heavily Democratic. As these votes were counted, the margin of the two lowered to just 2,000. And once again, the state was placed back in undecided, and Gore retracted his previous concession. The final vote had Bush's lead to just 300 votes, and this led to a recount. A count of the overseas ballots also increased Bush's margin to 930. Now we should probably mention hanging chads. The ballots in Florida had to be hole punched, and if the holes weren't punched properly, the vote was made ineligible. Also, the ballots in Florida were laid out weird. Look at this! I'm sure some people ended up voting for the wrong person by accident. 
In the end, the United States Supreme Court got involved, and in a 7-2 vote in favor of ending recounts as Florida was mishandling the process, making Bush the 43rd president. On August 24th, 1812, Britain made history as they had been the only nation to capture the American capital. This was a part of the War of 1812, being led by James Madison. On that same day, the British saw a major win of the Battle of Blandensburg, and this left DC wide open for an attack, and Britain went wild in the city, burning down several buildings, including the White House. Before this, once America lost at Blandenburg, James Madison was escorted from the White House. However, Dolly Madison stayed behind to save a massive portrait of George Washington. The, like we said, the portrait was massive, standing at over 8 feet tall, and was bolted to the wall. So the frame was broke, and the painting was taken away from Washington. Dolly instructed the handlers to destroy it before letting the British take it, if it came to that. But it didn't, and Washington was saved as the White House burnt. We've previously established that LBJ was a filthy man, and this adds to that. LBJ would often conduct meetings while on the toilet. He did this as a part of his intimidation, and part of creating an awkward environment to allow the person he was convincing to give in and end the discussion quick. He also had phones installed to all White House bathrooms to ensure that he never missed a phone call. And here we are, the first five tiers of the iceberg. Next week, we're going to cover tiers 6 through 10. If you want to hear about Jimmy Carter saving Canada from blowing up, a president making such a mess of themselves a new war was created, the forgotten female president, or a conspiracy about when a group of bankers tried to take over America, subscribe, check out my Discord server and Twitter linked in my bio, and check out the iceberg linked in the description if you want to look ahead. I'll see you next week, and until then, thanks for watching and have a wonderful day.